Starkiller here, back in the shed. Yeah, I'm way too comfortable. Actually, you do it. You start this off. <clears throat> okay, so what I have brought here is uh, the prototype and like my personal version of Obi-Wan's lightsaber from Star Wars Episode One. This is a new production that I'm doing in collaboration with Drew from the RPF. It goes by Dewey. Um, he is an amazing engineer, and the two of us, for about a year, worked on building a uh, 3D model that tries to capture every idiosyncrasy of the original prop. Um, the run is coming to fruition. I just got news from the shop that all the machining is done, and tomorrow I'm going to send them uh, the remaining payment so they can ship me the parts. And then uh, and then we'll all be done with this. It's been a labor of love in some ways for 20 years or so. Um, when episode one came out, I was, like many other people, a huge fan of Star Wars and really excited about it, like, coming back, um, you know, after after the first three movies of our childhood. Um, I was also an usher at a movie theater at the time. So really? I, yeah, I, I got to see, like, the final... And every every time, like, the movie was about to end, I would go in and watch The Duel one more time. No. Nope. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and just sort of stand back there with my broom. So I, I must have seen the at least the, du the final duel between Darth Maul and Obi-Wan and Qui-Gon, uh, you know, like a hundred times wow. like, in the theater. Um, and fell in love with this design. I thought... Um, you know, it was it was entirely new from what we thought it was going to be. You know, yeah. because back oh, then yeah. people were imagining graphlexes were going to be brought yep. up, and that you know Obi Wan would be using some version of the Alec in his saber, um, and they introduced an entirely new design. But twenty years later, this is as much of a classic as anything. Um, in I think two thousand five or six, I did a run in collaboration with um, with Orbital Machining. Um, I, I remember reading these, yeah, these old threads. That, that, that tried to capture all the nuances of, uh, of, that, of the saber. It was a static hilt that was half Delrin and half aluminum because the original prop is half resin and half aluminum. Um, and that was my pride and joy for a number of years until um, you know, Drew started pointing out little details that we had missed on the first go round, and trying to incorporate them in a new model. Um, what we have in front of us is this is an original stunt saber from Episode One. Obviously, they didn't use it in production because it's not or not painted. Uh, although it might have been a, a training saber or something like that that you could have bashed around. It had a big nasty misaligned seam line on the back of it, um, so that's probably why it didn't get used. But it was. Fantastic for reference. It allowed me to see details I had not seen, to understand the construction of the saber in a way that um, differed from a lot of replicas, and uh, and it was great for scaling. And, oh, yeah. and we've tried to incorporate all the details we have in this. Um, this is going to be my personal prop because it's also uh, all real parts. Um, in that I've replaced the uh, LED bezels with the found item. Um, that was recently discovered on the RPF. Um, the kit is going to come with machined bezels because they're they're slightly different. Um, they have a slightly higher profile than, than the found items. Um, and this is a real red button. Um, the, the same aircraft part that was used on the original Sabre. I have it taped because there's a serial number um, that, we, that I don't want made public right now. Those are the same ones on the Darth Maul, and all the other ones. This one, yeah, the red button. Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, um, this uh, Parker Barb is a found item, and with a uh, a purple uh, aircraft rivet um, that the kit is going to come with. I bought a supply of the original part and sent them to my shop in China, and um, they made the modifications that they needed to, and they're going to ship those back to me um, with with the um, version. So what you'll get is going to look like this, except the button's going to be different and the, and the bezels are going to be slightly different. I remember you telling me about you sending the shop the correct um, knurling tool 
yeah. the red button. Oh, it was such a pain in the ass. So the Neuralink tool on the red buttons has this weird inverse neural yeah. where the instead of so on like on the Neuralink tools I've used before, there are two um, wheels that cut at an angle and rotate and they cut a knurling pattern by sort of basically creating a hash yep. like on the piece as they roll along. But this knurling tool functions very differently. What it does is actually it's just single neural that you press into the side of the piece. It's, it's harder to work with. Um, and the, and the, the diamond pattern is sort of pressed into it rather than being cut and it's an inverse neural. So, so instead of um, the diamond sort of sticking out, they push in to the piece. Hmm. Um, it was quite difficult to sort of communicate with the shop that it has to look a certain way, it has to be cut at a certain angle, you have to use a particular tool. I must have gone through, you know, 10 prototypes with them until, until they got it correct. I remember seeing it, yeah, I remember seeing and it. And I ended up buying the original Neuralink tool, which Drew found, and shipping it to them because they were not able to, to make um, the pattern look exactly like it needed to do but now now they have and so so uh so there'll be a supply of correct you know dead on accurate um red buttons that, that i don't think anybody's quite got right um although the sabers is uh, new version is, is quite good he, he did a good job with the knurling pattern on his um there's some funny things about this that will stand out first of all it's a static hill it won't be able to take electronics which but, i like yeah I like that because too many sacrifices are made for FX. There are things like, so these recesses here, right? Um, th this diameter of the smaller section in the black yeah. rings is smaller than one inch. So if you put it, a one inch blade in an Obi-Wan Episode One Saber, it's, it's never going to be accurate because yep. y this has to cut deeper uh, than a one inch blade would allow. If you look at it, See, see how you, if you look at it from the side, you can see how deep it actually goes. Yeah, um, and that was something that I realized, you know, when looking at the original prop, right? Seeing how deep oh, those yeah, recesses yeah, yeah, yeah. actually cut in. Um, other things, each one of these pommel cubes is an individual piece. A lot of times, what people have done to replicate it, right, is they create a ring of pommel, yeah, the ring. pommel cubes, and then and then they it's sandwiched between two parts. That's not how the original is made. The original was made with each one of these pommel cubes as an individual piece that was sort of pressed into the, um, the, th the, uh, the pommel as a whole. This is one solid piece. The way we know that is we have some close-up pictures, like really super high res, um, in which you can see the back side of the pommel cube. So you can see that there's a, a recess where it doesn't quite uh, uh, mate with, with the rest of the pommel. And then also, on the original prop, at some point it fell, and it was hit at an angle like this, and the pommel cube flew out, and it cracked the, um, the resin pommel, because you can see a giant, like, C scar here, where it... Where, where there was a piece, a chunk taken out and then put back in and glued in. And the original prop has a has a scar from it. Now, so, would that be considered the hero? Yeah. That's the hero, okay. Yeah, that's the hero. And that's that was what, what this is cast from. All of, the, all of the stunts were cast from a single hero uh, metal plastic combo. Um, because, and the way that, I, that you can tell that is that every one of the stunts has a misaligned uh, emitter plate, right? At some point, whether it was when it was first made or early in its production, this emitter plate um, was attached to the rest of the saber at a slight angle. It's it's cockeyed, yeah. and every and that happened before any of the stunt sabers were cast because on every stunt saber, you can see that the emitter plate is similarly at an angle. What we did um, is when we were designing the saber, it was really important to me that we capture that detail. Um, Drew liked it a little bit more as he imagined it being first built and said, well, some people might not like it at an angle. Yeah. So we, we engineered it so that there is a, there's a rod that goes in the center here. We have a way in which it can be assembled perpendicular. And so it, it's, it's, a, it's a little more idealized. 
or you swap out the in, the inside core with the other part and it's at the slight angle and when and it has three screws that affix the plate to the the inside bar so it will line up correctly to the original prop crazy uh, cuz you can see you know as i turn oh, it yeah, around yeah, yeah, yeah. that it's it's at a pretty sharp angle and similarly with this one um, you can see how misaligned it is crazy mm -hmm. um so now each one, each one of these recesses has, has its own uh, dimensions. I mean, it, it's hard to tell, um, but when I took uh, micrometer and calipers to these, you could see that the numbers were slightly different. And when we compared them to our reference photos, um, it seemed to be across the board that these, this is something that was hand machined. And so, you know, it's just going to have a, a different geometry than something that's uh, programmed in CNC. It's really pretty. What's up with the O-ring there? Yeah, that, so it slides underneath, and the way that this is assembled, right, this and this are two separate parts. This part slides into this part. That's why you have this funny little gap here. Oh, yeah, yeah. Right? Yeah, yeah. So that was something we, we wanted to copy. That was something that I had on my on my last Saber run um, with, with Orbital Machining that I, I really wanted to capture, and I wanted to keep it. And then with the and then also the O-ring slides under slightly under the the, yeah, you can see uh, it in the, cast the emitter. Um, a lot of times you'll see just a straight, sort of straight angle where that black part either is something that they've machined as a, a metal piece or that doesn't fit underneath because there should be a slight gap. So we were able to capture that detail. Um, let's see what else. Oh, the 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 cutout here in the emitter. I remember you right. talking about this last Zoom call. Right. It's it's not the way that they machined it. Right. It's not even. These two have a different angle, and this part here, right where it turns, is cut at a slightly different angle. Um, it's consistent all the way around, but the two sides don't line up. So we wanted to capture that detail. Right. We wanted to make sure that these bars, right, go sort of they're cut straight down. Right, rather than sometimes, sometimes you'll see it at an angle. Oh, here. I get what you're saying. Yeah, on the edge. Yep. Right, because imagine like if I'm machining this with a, with with a, uh, if I have this in here, right, and I put down here with a milling machine, I can cut here and then go off to the side like this, but it would create an angle that is not present on the original. Yes. Yeah. What they did was they cut it like this. Right, did those two passes and then went back and cut this recess. Yep. Wow. Now, so that's what we did. And keeping those details consistent um, and being able to translate it to, a sh to the shop, right? It's tough. It's tough because a lot of times the, I'll, I will be describing counterintuitive machining practices to them and they won't necessarily understand, like, why do I have to machine it backwards? Like, <laughs> why, why, why shouldn't they be even, right? That, that's the... And the machine shops, they don't get that. They don't get that. No, we want the imperfections. And right. to convince them, it's tough to twist their arm because of how much more programming and how much more time it is on their end. And you're usually not talking directly to the machinist, right? You're talking through other people and trying yeah. to relay, no, 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 it has to be exactly like this. Uh, I, you know, like I said, I went through like six different prototypes I remember. with I remember. the red button. And then for the, they didn't have the proper knurling tool for uh, the gold uh, knob here. So we ended up just getting the found item because it was easier to have them um, modify the found item than it would be to try to replicate that knurling because it is also weirdly distinct. Oh, yeah. Wow, man. And then, like you said, each one of these is individually made. Oh, and it's also, it's also they're, they're not... Um, I noticed that yeah. on, on the table here. Yeah, they're, they're, they're not evenly spaced. So now, how does that... Does this come assembled? It comes, it comes semi-assembled. But what it is, is inside the pommel, there are pins that actually, the way that this pommel gets held on is there are like little uh, two millimeter um, set screws that hold the pommel onto the aluminum core. Okay. Right? So the set screws hold the pommel on in place, and then these cubes fit over the, the set screws and get glued into place. All right. So... It's like a little dab of super glue inside the hole, and then you push it in. Yeah, yeah. so those pin holes are for the alignment. Yeah. So you, it's and, foolproof. And each one of them is differently spaced around the outside. It's, I mean, it's not like bad and jarring um, if you don't know it's there, but if you do know it's there, 
you can definitely see it. There was right? two of them that I was looking at, and I, I thought... Yeah, you were like, oh, weird. Yeah, I yeah. thought... And you can see on the original, too, that they... Oh, wow, yeah, they, yeah. They're similarly misaligned. So, yeah. again, we wanted to capture all the details. This is, you know, it's a beautiful saber, but it is a warts and all replica. Right? Yeah. Where we're trying to... It's the most accurate one ever. I don't want to compare it to anybody else's work because there have been some fine work, especially uh, recently. Um, but this is this is as good as I'm going to ever get it. That's for I've sure. seen the work that you you and Drew put into this. Yeah. And, uh... I mean, he's an amazing engineer. I think he, he, I think he like, works for uh, aerospace, right? And... He's the guy that you want doing the CAD work for you. Yeah. Um, and he also is a, is is pretty obsessive with this stuff. Like he he's gone back and made, you know, probably twenty different models of just this emitter um, sleeve, because you know we were trying to get it just right. That thread you guys had was at the top for weeks. Yeah. Weeks. Yeah. A lot of activity. Yeah. So we're excited to to have it in hand to. Uh, it's gonna come with black delrin. I've actually painted this a light a light coating, really, um, just to get it the specific um, tone that I wanted. So what um, what color do you recommend for paint? Uh, I think I used a rust oleum satin. The Canon satin black we yeah. use on the heroes. Yeah, but I I can go back and check on that. Um, and it, it comes as you know freshly machined black delrin, so you don't have to paint it if you don't want to. Um, and if you do paint it, all you'll need is a very light. Yeah, touch because you know it's not it's covering black itself. So yeah, it looks really sharp. Yeah, really really sharp. And now <clears throat> remind my memory again. Uh, when's the time frame for this to be in the shop? Well, I mean the the website. Well, I the or, I'm, so I'm not selling them on on the at Stars End website like I've been doing recently. Okay. This is a good old fashioned RPF run where people signed up ahead of time and committed to a spot on the on the order i didn't take money uh up front but i did say like if you sign up for this you're making a commitment and you are going to pay up when it's ready so when these are ready they will go to all the people that have signed up on the rpf there might be a couple extra at the end um because sometimes you know people sign up and then drop out of these things um but i i don't imagine there that you'll see many of them because i think they're gonna be pretty high, highly sought after and how many signed up I think I got 125 wow okay wow which is a big sign up for the rpf actually well i like that because it's old school yeah there was no you go to my website and purchase it it was always the list well when we decided to go you know warts and warts and all static sabers i wanted to make sure that 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 they went to rpf people that would like appreciate um you know a replica of what was on set, not an idealized, yep. you know, functional lightsaber, which have been more the vogue lately, um, in especially like in, in Facebook and some of the other forums. I wish it went back to more uh, static stuff. Yeah. I really do. Well, I mean, there's a there's a place for there's a place for both. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Um, but something like this, you know, I didn't, it's, it, I didn't want to, I didn't want to compromise the design. Um, and, you know, there are collectors that say, I, I want to hold the prop that Ewan McGregor held, not the lightsaber that, that Obi-Wan Kenobi held. And, yeah. and that's what this is. Yeah. Wow. I mean, you've had, like you said, since 1999, you were a kid and you wanted to do this, and finally and, it's here. Yeah, I remember being in a, a Chinese history class and just and doodling on my notebook, um, you know, things that I wanted to, to do to modify my larbell. Did you ever I think... think back then that you'd have something like this today i didn't think that we would ever have this degree of accuracy because the tools just didn't exist right i mean this was before 3d printing yeah i knew basic cad design 2d cad I, I had never done 3d cad um and so you know like i would i would have had no concept of how how to do this type of engineering not just that stuff but like what a lot of the community doesn't realize is back then the internet was in its infancy still mm -hmm. and pictures yeah online was far and few yeah you know oh, if yeah. you found a website with star wars pictures it was like wow yeah let alone prop pictures yeah so it's just incredible where we've gone and how spoiled we've become yeah and it helps to like have one of the originals that you just sort of stare at for 20 years i've heard about this thing <laughs> 
I've heard about this stunt that he's had for as long as I've known him, and today's the first time I've actually seen it. Oh, so he, he su yeah, you surprised me by bringing this here today. Oh, there you go. Yeah, so it's it's really cool. We have this lineage piece here in the shed. Yeah. Wicked cool. I have to put you, have you build me a stand or something where I can display the two of them. Yeah, hell yeah. Make it out of some mahogany with some varnish. Okay. I think... I've heard they've sold out of varnish, though, in, <laughs> in, uh, in Fairhaven after yeah. you built this table. <laughs> no. But no, I... So, so, so there's this, and then next is Qui-Gon. No! Yeah. I didn't know about that. Oh, yeah. Yeah, Drew's done tons Is he of doing cabin. it on the RPF now? Mm -hmm. Oh, see, because I've been, I've been off the RPF. That one will probably go quicker because the button's already taken care of, which was a real pain in the yeah. ass to get done. Um, it's... Similar, we got similar fantastic references. I don't have a stun um, like that for Qui Gon, but we do have really, really good high res images um, that were that are not publicly available, which we were able to use. We found you know some really weird, interesting details in it that I'd never noticed before, like a little screw hole in the center of Qui, well, Qui Gon's grip um, that we could we could see when we zoomed in. Really, we didn't know it was there. Yeah, things like. Uh, you know, on the Qui-Gon saber, right, there's the sort of two hooks on each side. Yeah, the yeah, yeah. That they're, they're not symmetrical. They're they're very different. Um, and so, you know, those are things that, like, we're incorporating into our design. Um, weirdly ground down. Um, the recesses in the tip of, or in the emitter section, right, have a very strange geometry right, that's, that we're, that we're capturing. And, and Drew also has had to do a lot of scaling um, with the Qui-Gon because, in all of the props we've been able to look at, um, you know, you get a lot of variability in terms of like the size of the stunt um, and the original hero and the hero. And so, you know, he's done a hell of a lot of work nailing down uh, the dimensions of the original hero that we're copying. Wow. And so I'm pretty excited about that. And then, you know, with this one and the Darth Maul and the Qui Gon, that's my duel of the fates. Yeah, because um, you got the static hilts. Yeah. So I'm, I'm happy to have that, that done. So with the Qui Gon, that's going to be RPF sign up too, it's right? Going to be RPF sign All right. Too, so yeah. if anybody interested in jumping on that needs to register with the RPF yeah. and um, keep an eye out for the in the project run th uh, section for that. Yeah, the Qui Gon wasn't it wasn't as big of a, a, a favorite saber for me until two things until we. Um, we got all these new references and started working on it and seeing all of, like the weirdness to it. Yeah. Um, because that made it more interesting to me, and then also in um, in the Oculus game. The Vader Immortal. Yeah, yeah. They sort of give you like a Qui Gon esque saber to, really? to duel with, and so since I've been playing around with that, I'm like now I kind of want a Qui Gon saber to, to complete the collection. Wow. So now, is the Qui Gon saber gonna have a steel emitter? Yeah. All right. I didn't. Yeah, oh, wow. Same thing. Wow. Yeah. Middle. This is a fender fender washer in the end. Um, oh, it at it right now. Yeah. No sir. Yeah. And yeah, that's that's how all the all the episode one sabers had a fender washer in the end and a cut off, um, a cut off uh, threaded rod. One of the funny things is right, you can see that it's not just a flat disc, right? It's a threaded rod that's been cut because there's a little gap. Yeah. Know? And so we have that replicated on the original. Oh too. my I forgot god! About that detail. No sir. Yeah, a lot of a lot, a lot of weird. I <laughs> was just gonna ask you how did, how did you get that to crease in like that yeah, when so you cut it. It's the, we've 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 engineered the piece uh, you know, Drew, Drew engineered the piece to be able to get the proper clocking of the threaded rod um, and then you insert the emitter plate um, and so it all lines up with the original. That was wicked. Yeah. And like I said it's very minimal to put together. It's oh, like yeah. you have to put together. By any chance, is the Qui Gon the same length as the Obi Wan? I don't know what the number he came up with actually. I was um, just I, out of I don't I don't want to I don't want to speak out of out of turn. I think it's a little bit longer, but um, but I'm gonna have to I'll have to check back on Drew with that. I was just curious out of like production if they all made them a certain length or or whatnot. But did you remember in the original video, the making of video, where they're talking about length and uh, and you and saying uh, yeah, that. The myth is size doesn't matter. No, it is. <laughs> That's when he picks the one out of the... Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's a great video of, like, you know, fucking 20-year-old Ewan McGregor getting <laughs> to play with his first lightsaber. It's it's kind of surreal when you think about 
it's kind of how long ago that was, right? Yeah, now, yeah, yeah. I skipped school to see episode one, and I got detention. Um, yep, the rumor got around that I skipped to go see Star Wars, and they gave me detention. Well, there are worse reasons to get detention. Yeah. I think it's funny that he randomly picked a saber, and it has a pommel, kind of like Obi-Wan's. Mm -hmm. You know? It's kind of like fate. Yeah. But wow. I, again, I can't thank you enough for bringing this to the shed, finally. I got to, to see that, and it's crazy. And when do you think these will be done? You, you're ordering extra parts. You're ordering parts now. All the parts have been machined. When you when I place an order with the shop, I give them half up front, then they do the machining, and I and they they I double check everything to make sure it all came out right, and then I send in the second half. So I'm sending in the second half of the payment um, tomorrow. Look at this uh, this chamfer here mm -hmm. with this and that. Yeah. Yeah, that it, was something that we I don't know if I had that correct thing on the on the last one. Yeah. Wow. It's just mind blowing that these guys did this all by hand. You know what I mean? Well, that's why it has so many funny idiosyncrasies to it. Because if you did it on CNC, everything would would add up. You know, to to equal angles and you know equal cuts and equal distances and stuff like that. But when you machine anything on a hand, there's going to be um, you know small idiosyncrasies from one cut to another. And then when you're trying to replicate those those idiosyncrasies. Um, you know, you have to sort of think like that, not not like a not like an engineer now. With me, when I see stuff like this in my head, the first thing I think of is, what? How do you hold it in the machine yeah. to make these kind of cuts? Yeah. Um, because I work with the stuff I do is very crude, and the stuff that the tools I have to make to hold something, you know, is very primitive compared to stuff like this. Well, in some ways, right? Like when you talk about how these were cut. In some ways, like your setup here, more closely replicates like what they would have had on hand because there wasn't. This was all done before three D printing. Yeah. Right. They were not making these props on a five axis mill, right? So they couldn't do a lot of like complicated cuts. The fountain parts, right, have complicated engineering into them because you know they were they were aerospace parts. Right, but then, but these are you know they just found them at Bob's Bits and sort of screwed them onto everything. Um, Crazy. It's trying to copy it twenty years later that becomes a pain in the ass when things like the LED bezels when those don't exist anymore, right? When you can't find a, a boatload of um, you know aircraft hole plugs right randomly to the, put them on all of all of your props. The bezels don't exist anymore, but these are original bezels you hunted down. These are original bezels I and, hunted and down and replicated. Yeah. yeah. Um, we'll have machine copies um, that have a an easy. The threading on these is really weird. It's not. It's not a normal standard threading. You've told me that. Yeah. So I had to. I had to like modify that myself. But we have a standard threading on 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 these. So did you ever find out why the threading was different? Just randomly. That's how they made them. Some electrical component from like you know 1994. Oh wow, wow. You know I've seen the pictures online and everything, but once you actually get to see it. In real world, you can see all the, I don't want to say imperfections, but what's the word I'm looking yeah. for? Yeah. The man-made imperfections, mm -hmm. you know? And, and this is this is made on a CNC. I wonder how hard it is for the CNC to do the, the inaccuracies. As long as you program it um, correctly, it can do a lot of what you need it to do. The problem is, is just there's a lot of counterintuitive programming that has to happen, right? Like that, it's like when you design something in CAD, um, you make a couple choices, and then the computer makes other choices yes. for you that just go into making any object three dimensional. You have to then tell the computer to undo those choices to get it to machine it in the way that you want it to, not in the way that it would just sort of intuitively guess. It reminds me of the time when we were working on DS2 with the rings, yeah. and I make you move this a little bit, that, and it changes everything on you. You have to go back and change everything. Yeah. You're ready to kill me. Yeah. Incredible job. To, my hat's off to you and uh, to Dewey on the RPF. And you guys put in a lot of work, a lot of hours into this thing. Yeah, and Dewey's going crazy with the Qui-Gon. He's, I, I mean, we, he and I talked about it originally, and we've been, and we worked on it behind the scenes, um, but since he. Um, since he has worked on he's worked on it subsequent to that period and just gone over and over and over again with the model uh, and just put in tons and tons of work on it so i'm gonna have to sign in and check it out yeah 
he's done he's done a great job with that. So that's pretty much going to wrap this one up. Uh, I want to personally thank Star Killer for coming out here and sharing this with me and bringing the the real prop to the shed. And uh, I want to thank. I hope I get out of here with it. <laughs> I want to thank uh, Dewey on the RPF, Drew. I want to thank you for putting all the the time and effort into this thing. It's incredible, man. What a job. And I look forward to when the run is complete and putting this in the display case. Uh, Hallowex and Starkiller out. <laughs>